Good evening and welcome to Copperfields Books virtual event with Lyanda Lynn Hawk in conversation with Erica Bauermeister. My name is Jamie Madsen and I'm the marketing and events coordinator here at Copperfields Books and I'll also be your host for the evening. For 40 years, Copperfields Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together. I'd like to take a moment here and thank you all for supporting our events program. It allows us to continue providing these free events. So for that, we are very grateful. And just a couple items to note before we get started. I will be using the chat box, so keep your eye out to uh, provide links to view upcoming Copperfields events, details for purchasing tonight's title, as well as a discount code. Um, I will also be including previous titles by both authors tonight and my contact details if you have any issues or follow-up information. Additionally, the Q&A box will be your go-to with any questions or comments. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a little icon that says Q&A. Go ahead and submit any questions or comments under this icon as they come up during the event. Um, the format will feature between 30 to 40 minutes of speaking and will then be followed by the live Q&A. Um, yeah, without further ado, I'm really, really excited for tonight's event and to introduce tonight's author, Lyanda Lynn Hot. Lyanda is a naturalist, echo philosopher, and author of Mozart's Starling, Crow Planet, Pilgrim on the Great Bird Continent, and Rare Encounters with Ordinary Birds. A winner of the Washington State Book Award and the Sigurd F. Olson Nature Writing Award, she currently lives in Seattle with her husband and daughter. And in conversation with Lyanda tonight is Erica Bauermeister. Erica is the New York Times bestselling author of four novels, including The Scent Keeper. Her latest work is a memoir entitled House Lesson Lessons, Renovating a Life. They are with us tonight to discuss Lyanda's latest title, Rooted, Life at the Crossroads of Science, Nature, and Spirit. I know we're all really excited to dive into this. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, Erica. Why don't you take us away? Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, and before we even start, I just want to say um, thank you to Jamie and to Copperfield's books. Um, you know, Jamie makes us all look really effortless. And you all need to know how much time goes into these kind of events behind the scenes, what the booksellers are doing, not only just choosing authors that they think that you're going to be interested in, but also in the setting up and the creation and the, the 20 minutes of getting the tech ready before we even start. Um, they are amazing people. So please support them with your purchases. Um, they, they keep our culture going. They are why authors like Landa and I are able to continue to write because they are handing you books and saying, read these um, in a way that an algorithm online will never do. So thank you to Jamie, thank you to Copperfield. Um, I am so excited to be here tonight because I have been reading Landa's books for years. Um, I actually, uh, back when Landa's Rare Encounters with Ordinary Birds came out, I so fell in love with that book that my father, who was sliding into dementia, was able to listen to audiobooks but couldn't read. Uh, but was loved books. And I literally, because there was no audio book of the book at that time, I literally read this book aloud into cassette tapes that I then sent to him because I thought her use of words was so gorgeous and her insights were so beautiful. So it is a complete honor to be the person who gets to ask her questions um, tonight. Um, what I'd like to do before I start asking questions is just pitch it to Landa, let her introduce herself a little more and give you a little bit of a reading because that's what we're here for is this book. And then I've got plenty of questions to ask her afterwards. So Landa, go ahead. Thank you, Erica. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. I'd forgotten the detail about the cassette tapes. How wonderful, very sweet story. Thank you. Uh, thank you Copperfield's books for having us here tonight. Ditto, echo everything that Erica said, and Jamie, thank you for setting it up. And thank you all for being here. I know that it's a beautiful evening out and I appreciate your hopping in to chat with us. So my new book is Rooted. I wanna show you the cover because I love it. Uh, the cover art and the interior art is by a young UK artist named Helen Nicholson. She lives in Brighton which if you're a Jane Austen fan will make you jealous as it makes me. Um, and I'll show you a couple of her images as we talk tonight. I just, they wander like little enchantments through the pages and I just couldn't be more fortunate in um, kind of sharing this project with an illustrator. So I'd started writing this book a 
couple of years ago, more than a couple of years ago, you know how it goes with book writing, it takes root for a while before it comes to fruition. Um, but it was at a time where I was talking to my editor, editor and we were discussing the state of ecological and political crisis, unprecedented crisis on all of the fronts we could think of. And that was before the pandemic. That was before the pandemic. We can think about that in all of the civil unrest, essential conversations that have happened through this time. Um, and so the question for all of us then and sort of remains that I hear echoed in conversations over and over is all of this is happening and I focus on the ecological in this book, um, but all of the questions are relate, interrelated as we know. Um, you see, in light of all this, wh what do we do? What do we do? How, how do we live? And it's a question that brings us a lot of overwhelm and even paralysis because the options are so great. And the answer is not pat. There is no one answer that is suitable for everyone. And yet I wanted to take on this question. And so what I offer in this book is not a single answer that um, of how do I live that can work for individuals, but a, a sort of an offering of way markers and guideposts for exploring that question for ourselves to make that question make sense in terms of our relationship with nature. So I discuss things like um, how we walk upon the earth, how we use language to speak of the natural world and other than human beings, how we relate to trees and animals, how we create in service of the natural world and one another, um, how we eventually apprentice ourselves to that question of life and death and life again um, in, the, in the great spiral of being. So I offer these themes as guideposts for us, all of us seeking our way together. And so with that in mind, I'm going to read from the first chapter called Pilgrim on the Wolf Path. That is not what it's called. It is called Listen, the Wild Summons of the Wolf Path. <laughs> Write it, then forget it. Um, and I want to share the illustration that starts this chapter by Helen. I feel like library story time here where you show the illustration, but I love this kind of wandering, following this beautiful wild creature into the woodland. So this is for the moment when all of us sort of face that question and tilt our ear toward the idea of how to, to enter um, the consideration of how to live in this time. Um, and it starts with the story of Little Red and Little Red Riding Hood actually. And the predator in the traditional tellings and the union analysis of that tale sort of placed the wolf in the role of predator, like capital P predator, that thing which lures all of us at some point away from our highest path and truest self. From this perspective, we learn to avoid this wolf as part of our maturation. But my reading of the tale is different. When the wolf lures Red off the trail, he sets her a task, something to occupy her time so that he can pad over to the grandmother's house and eat her up. The task is picking wildflowers. Now, instead of just a boring tin of muffins for her grandmother, Red will show up with a basket full of wild beauty that she gathered herself from the forest, treasures not found on the well-traveled path. She will find her own way through the woods, and when she arrives, yes, she will be eaten by the wolf as her grandmother was before her. But it turns out that they are both perfectly well. They are swallowed whole by the wild and emerge exhilarated. They place the flowers on the table and feast with an exquisite new hunger. I am positive that at the end of the tale, when Red promises her wise elder grandmother that from now on she will stay on the path, it is with a wink and a nudge between them. The grandmother has known for some time and Red is just learning. Who wants an everyday path paved and void of danger when we can have beasts and shadows and secret flowers and unexpected visits from the feral wolf of our imaginations? A little change of pace in the next section here. The ritual of entrance into most monastic orders is kept largely secret from the public. But a Benedictine monk friend told me about one of the most powerful moments in his own profession of vows. Benedictine's pledge to an outwardly paradoxical life of simultaneous 
conversion and stability, a constant evolution of mind and spirit within the rootedness of a particular community. When asked a series of questions about the uncompromising spiritual commitment he was vowing to make, my friend's ancient traditional response was one that offered no space for irony or hesitation. The word is Latin from the monastic ritual dating back to the 16th century. Ad sum, I am here. Sorry, I'm gonna just skipping around a touch there. The ad sum of monastic profession is not the be here now of pop mindfulness practice. In this context, it indicates a radical openness to an entire life of psychological wilderness, one of few comforts and constant uncertainty, the life in a form that we all live. When Rachel Carson's beloved friend, Dorothy Freeman, inquired in a letter why Rachel must delve into the unpleasantness of the poisons book, as they both called the Silent Spring before it actually had a working title, Rachel responded that she felt called by the dead birds she'd held in her hands and could not live knowing what she had learned about DDT without speaking, without her gift, lifting her pen to write, I'd assume. Who among us has not heard it? the wolf of this beloved damaged earth beckoning us by name just outside our safe living room, demanding our own response. The strange and persistent furry pod knocking, we peek tentatively through the door, just ajar, and see that there is no road, no sidewalk, barely a trail, and that obscured by leaves, by stones, by an intimation of the remains of those who have walked before us on the unyielding circle of life. Hope you can hear me over the airplane, <laughs> live outdoors here. In spite of it all, we long to walk this path, for we know that there is more than what has been given and named by the overculture, more than what we have been told is true, more than green gardens and nature calendars and recycling and a summer hike in the mountains and an occasional camping trip, more even than an hour long forest bath, however lovely that sounds. We know that there is a wilder earth and upon it, within it, a wilder, more authentic human self. We know the need of each for the other is absolute. I'd assume we pack our satchel lightly and cross the threshold. Stop there for now. Well, that's beautiful. Uh, you know, I have to say, I got to read an early version of this um, and it was probably back when the pandemic was still kind of a new thing and things were overwhelming. It was really overwhelming. And one of the things I, I so appreciated about the book was that it was both inspiring and invigorating, but it was also really calming. You know, I mean, there's something beautiful about the writing and just that, I mean, it was a bit like going forest bathing just within the confines of the book. And um, I appreciated that a great deal. Um, one of the things that I, I love about the book and I love books that are like this, um, is that you really blend the personal and the philosophical and kind of the manifesto um, and, and you intertwine them, you interweave them, which I think is part and parcel of the theory that you're putting forth. Um, but I'm just wondering when you were writing the book, creating the book, how did you, I mean, did you have a bunch of three by five cards you spread out on a table? I mean, what was the process of deciding when you were gonna go personal, when you were gonna bring in the other? It's a great question. It was actually a really difficult book for me to structure. And when I started writing, I thought the structure was going to be more straightforward than it is. Mm -hmm. And it, actually, it's it's kind of both. And the structure on that surface was going to be more complicated. It was going to be arranged like a spiral, sort of inward, the philosophical dimension, and then outward, the more um, active dimension. But that fell apart really quickly when I realized that I really couldn't separate those two dimensions of being or thinking, at least for me. And same with the science, nature, and spirit. I had this big diagram. They were going to be kind of a Venn diagram where they overlapped in the middle. And, um, and that didn't work either. And I thought that was the middle was where I was going to focus. But it turns out that I could not sensibly disentangle science, nature, and spirit and conversing about them. And so they all just really, um, the subject matter led the way in terms of, um, in terms of setting up these themes and, and wandering within them. And to be honest, Erica, after that, when I write, 
it, it's actually sort of how I think. I think, you know, I think about immersion. I think about my personal reflection. I write that. I think, oh my gosh, is this validated in the scientific literature? Because I've studied a lot of natural history and science, um, biological science. And then um, in terms of spirit, I, I want to say that I use that word very expansively. I talk a, a little bit in the book about being raised Catholic, but it's not a book that's about religion. So if you are religious or you're not religious, it's it, it doesn't it doesn't matter, but I use spirit to talk, to speak to that dimension of human intelligence that is not able to be measured by traditional scientific means. So our, our imagination, our creativity, our, that sense of interconnection that we feel sometimes that sort of transcends rationality, that maybe there aren't names for it. And there certainly aren't measures for that, but it's part of the depth of our beautiful intelligence. And it hearkens to and from us in the natural world in a particular way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you mentioned the Catholic Church. It, it, it brings up an interesting point that you talk about in the book, which is that you both were raised Catholic, but also you had frog church. And, <laughs> and I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about, I mean, those were both very important spiritual aspects of your life and offered, but I believe they offered very different things. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how they how they fit together because you were doing both at the same time. Right. So I was raised Catholic. And um, one of the things that I didn't know anything about religions or any of the coming conflicts in the Catholic church, of course. And um, I didn't even know that women couldn't be priests, to be honest. <laughs> I just thought our priest was a man, um, even as a child. But um, what I loved about being raised Catholic, and I was in a house in a church that didn't emphasize guilt, so I don't have that um, recovering Catholic aspect to my life that people talk about. Um, but what I'm grateful for is being raised with these saints that were wandering through my life that were so conversant with a very wild way of being in relationship to the world to the world. Saints who, you know, spoke with wolves and had sermons with birds and bowed to ravens and lived in caves and, you know, baked bread and clay ovens. It just had these wild lives outside of not just the culture of our time, but the culture of their own time. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, wow, there are so many ways to live in relation to nature and to honor the sacredness of the natural world and our connection to it. Um, so it really, that delimiting of, of thinking about relationship was a gift to me from that upbringing. Um, but also as a child, yeah, I had Frog Church. And to be honest, I don't know if I've even told you this, Erica, but this book was called Frog Church until just a couple months before, I think even during the final edit, it was still, or my editor's last edit, it was, um, it was still called Frog Church. But my publisher finally decided it was too weird. <laughs> and they're probably right. So that is the chapter of the introduction, which I call the invocation. And it comes from the experience I had being raised with a canyon in our backyard. We just lived in a little suburb south of Seattle, had a canyon in our backyard that went down to a creek. And that is where I found my truest sanctuary. I would go down there alone. I was a very, you know, introverted kid, uh, classic child writer story. <laughs> And I would take my notebook and my apple and my sketch pad and go down there and hang out um, in the creek with the creek. And there were a lot of frogs there then. And we, we would go down and catch them as kids. But in my time and what I came to call frog church, I learned that when they're just hanging out at the edge of the stream, you don't really have to catch a frog. You can just, if you're quiet and you wait to the right moment, you can just kind of slip your hand under one and lift it up and they don't mind at all. And I would lie on my back and sort of press, place them along my belly and just I try to hold still so they wouldn't hop away. And it was just exercise in mindfulness and stillness. I mean, didn't know those words, then, but, mm -hmm. um, but it was. And I just remember lying on my back, looking up at the trees with the frogs. And that was another form of church for me. And I think That's it's marvelous. Honest. And, and I think it speaks to who you are that out of all the things you could have gotten from Catholic Church, what you get are the outliers. You get the wild people. You don't get the restrictions. You don't get the traditions and the rituals. You go for the saints. I mean, you uh, and you go for the, the out there saints, you know, and, and and with Frog Church, you know, you you 
release yourself to nature. You're not trying to see what nature can get from you. You're trying to just be part of it. And, and, and I just think it's a, it, I think that speaks to who you are. Cause I think a lot of people could have had both that Canyon and church and come out of the, the experience completely differently than you did. So um, it's, it's very cool. So along that line, I want to ask you, because you do, you, you mentioned before poetry and science. And I think one of the things that makes your writing unusual is that it is both scientific and poetic. You come at it from both sides. And I wonder where you see the intersection between those two and where you kind of see the, the, the inspiring part of that intersection. Well, obviously science is really important right now. It's giving us guidance. We know that from the pandemic more than ever. We know it from climate crisis. We know it going forward setting conservation parameters. You know, we live in a place where um, the Southern resident killer whales, the orcas are thin and their numbers are dwindling and our hearts are broken. And we need science to support our efforts to bring to our legislators. And we need that to speak to our hearts as well. Um, I see a lot in, in nature writing. I see a lot of people criticizing the objectivity of science. And there is a sense in which um, science being limited by quantification and lexiconic language does sort of sever things sometimes. But, um, and there is bad science and <laughs> terrible scientists probably. But I will say, just as there's bad writing. Um, but I will say that if you meet um, a, science, a biological scientist steeped in their project and work, um, they can be some of the people most steeped in wonder that you have ever met mm -hmm. and may or may not be able to write well about it. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so I think that um, a lot of times it's a great overlap for people that can speak, can bring this beautiful science that speaks to more and more is speaking to a deep interconnection um, and consciousness within the natural world. Um, the new work on trees and um, mm -hmm. fungus is just, uh, you know, in incredible, blowing our minds open. And there's so much poetry there, but um, we do need people who can bring those stories to the world in language that touches hearts and, and invites participation. So that's a beginning of too. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, and along those lines, one of the, one of the I, and you play with words a lot and you bring in new concepts. And one of, one of them for me was the, what, the idea of kin and kith. Mm -hmm. and kith was a new concept for me. I wonder if you can talk just a little bit about what's the difference between kin and kith. Oh, okay. So you hadn't heard that, um, that phrase, kith and kin? I heard kith and kin, but it was like, okay, yeah. Sometimes I flipped it around and I thought, I don't know what kith actually means. And so I wish someone, and you explained it so beautifully and I think it's an important concept. So if you can do it again here. So no one does. I didn't either. We use that phrase kith and kin and we sort of conflate them. And even in England where that phrase originated, people do the same thing. And I learned this in the beautiful work of Jay Griffiths. Um, she wrote a book called A Country Called Childhood. It was actually called kith in England, but in America they renamed it because we couldn't even be trusted to understand the word, nor know that the word kith existed at all. So um, she talks about this, that the reason the phrase actually has two words is because they have two different meanings. So kin is our our, our relatives, the people that we traditionally think of as kin, our, our, our near family, maybe our dearest friends, who we say, our like family, our kin. Kith is a relationship based on knowledge of a place. So kith is, as Jay Griffith said, you're one square mile. So if I walk outside my door, it's knowing, or just even here on my porch, it's knowing the difference between the two female Anna's hummingbirds that are coming to my feeder, the one that rapidly darts in and out when she feeds and the other who just sits there and looks around between sips and the difference of their size and where their nest is and how much the robins dislike the Anna's hummingbirds and you know um and, and so where every stone and creature exists in relationship to us and our lives and so it, it's a place and relationship based knowledge and I love that it's something that we're losing now and um so I, I i like to bring up the idea of kithship which is sometimes um kinship is really popular right now among people that are thinking about ecological philosophy and how we're kin with all of other beings um i think that kithship opens it up to an even deeper discussion of the way we walk in relationship to living and sort of the, what we traditionally think of as a non-living substrate um, 
I know I'm sort of being a little bit incoherent, but I, I hope that oh, gives no, you the no, gist no. of the subject. I think I, I'm just going to say traditionally, I, I say traditionally non-living because I, I think anyone who studies soil or rivers or oceans where we can't locate a central nervous system and so don't think of them traditionally as living, we do think of them as living systems or even beings sometimes. Yeah. Well, and I think that was one thing that after I read your book, I became completely annoying with a lot of people because <laughs> I, I, you know, I, they would be talking about, I don't know, a, an animal or something. And I'd say, you know, oh, it was my father-in-law. We were having this conversation. And, and I said, just because you don't know how that animal thinks doesn't mean that animal isn't thinking. That, that, that's a short change on our part, not to be able to comprehend it. Um, and, and it's myopic for us to think that our way of thinking is the only way of thinking or the only way of processing the universe. All you gotta do is watch a dog taking a walk and smelling to know we don't know everything at all. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was just so great to be reading that part of the book and, and to explore that concept more because I think it's fascinating and I think it's important. Um, along that line, there's this idea of reciprocity that you talk, to, I've talked about and you, use, you have this quote, if we walk in the woods, we must feed the mosquitoes. <laughs> um, and I'm just curious, can you talk a little bit about how you might bring that concept into someone's everyday life? I mean, how does, if you ascribe to that philosophy, what does it mean you got to be ready for? Right. Um, so that phrase or quote is often attributed to Emerson, but I could not source it exactly. So I, I, I just threw it out there. I think it might be one of those vague kind of attributed <laughs> quotes. But um, so the idea there, I think, comes from you know, I was thinking about it in this book in relationship to some of the new science that I take a little bit off the beaten path look at um, compared to other current thinkers, current ecological thinkers. Um, and I'm talking about forest bathing, which is this beautiful idea that comes from Japan. And in Japan in the 80s, people were going to their doctors or their therapists and being actually prescribed time in nature for anxiety and anxiety uh, related um, ailments, right? So eventually the medical and scientific establishment said, you can't just be handing out prescriptions for things. We actually need evidence-based research. And so the science rose up, started in Chiba University. And um, now there's just wraps and boatloads of this evidence that shows us how, when we spend time in nature for even 15 minutes, our, the hemoglobin in our free, prefrontal cortex that um, is related to emotional balance and imagination becomes balanced, our blood pressure drops, our heart rate stabilizes, our parasympathetic nervous system, the part that makes us calm um, is, is activated and rebalanced. So all on and on, all of these things. Um, and so what has happened is that as in the United States, we've sort of made that, making that into a little bit of a business and an industry, and it does invite people into the woods. And I wanna honor that. Um, aspect of it. But I want to be really careful about using that science to go, all right, if I just need to walk in the woods for 15 minutes to get the benefits, what will nature do for me? What's the list of things that nature, that I can get from nature? And when we do that, we are commodifying nature again, making it into a resource, kind of pill, kind of day spa, kind of therapist. And that commodification, even when it's framed in this you know, beautiful language of, of, of um, we are healthier in nature, which it does show, it does affirm what we knew that, that nature calms and heals us. Um, but when we look at nature in terms of what can I get from it, then we're stepping out of the circle of reciprocity. And I wanna ask us to go back to the question of not what can nature do for me, but how do I live? You know, Mary Oliver said that so beautifully, what will you do with your one wild and pre precious life? And we find that when we walk in nature, not only to receive, but to offer in return. And we can do that in really simple ways, just by walking peacefully with attention and witness and mindfulness. Uh, I, I'm not saying that has to be some big grand thing, but just walking with that, not, not what can I get, but how are we, how, what's the circle? Mm -hmm. What can I learn? If nothing else, what can I learn? Yeah. 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 So, can I break and have you read one more part? You were talking about calm and anxiety, and, and, and I know that there's a part um, that you were going to read about the calm and the anxiety of creation. Uh, if you can read a little bit more, that would be great. So I chose this earlier, and I was going to, I try to read something different in these virtual talks since people 
can watch you in different places. Um, and I chose this earlier. And when I peeked at it again just now, the, before we began, I thought, oh, this is kind of darker than I thought it was. But I've been talking to some friends. And even as we are emerging from this past period of time, um, people are still really struggling with a lot of the changes going on and feeling kind of panicky still. Um, hearing a lot of panicky feelings. And so this is my offering just for, for all of us together. If you picture me serenely writing this book with a pencil in hand and a rustic notebook in my lap while basking in dappled sun beneath, like, oh, is your sun, you're not quite as dappled as you were when we began, Erica. <laughs> I was dappled. <laughs> sun. Beneath a leafy, old moss and fern covered maple, you would be much of the time mostly correct. I always prefer to write outdoors in the path of my subject matter, and I contrive all kinds of ways to make this happen, even when the weather is not summery. But the serene part, anyone who knows me would laugh out loud. Sometimes, sure, I sit there calm and sweet among the trees in classic nature writer pose, face upturned to the voices of birds like Keats under his plum, twirling my little pointed pencil. In truth though, I am overall a fretful writer plagued by anxiety and insomnia and self-doubt and deadline dread and procrastination and self-recrimination for my procrastination. When I get super stressed, a walk in the woods is the best curative. Poets and scientists and poet scientists often suggest that the resulting calm comes in large part from the tranquility of the natural landscape. The soft focus we receive in the presence of laughing waves, whispering leaves, wandering clouds. But while I'm not finding any science to support it yet, I have come to realize that it is not only the peace of the forest green that settles my overwrought nervous system. Quite the opposite. It is the simultaneous recognition that all organisms in the natural world are just as anxious and vulnerable as I am. The lives of most creatures, except the highest level carnivores, are spent in a constant state of vigilance to avoid being eaten. Plants too share this evolutionary compulsion, spending bioenergy in the production of thorn, toxins, warning color, and chemical communication with their botanical kindred to avoid the nibbling of insects and deer. Wolves, cougars, and grizzlies, meanwhile, face the cruel threat of not being able to provide enough meat to sustain themselves and their young. The natural world is a severe, uneasy place. This is where I started to realize it was too dark for tonight, but fear not. <laughs> the depressive anxiety that visits me sometimes finds pur purchase there and consolation. Not in calm beauty, but in continuity, in mutual empathy. We are all in this together. Alert after a walk in my Northwest woods, I look up to see the talons of the Cooper's hawk, hot with the blood of the Swainson's thrush there at the forest edge. I am enfolded, seen, wildly serene. I steady my shaky hand with a deep breath of tree air and lift my pencil again. So, so you opened the pandemic door here. Um, and I'm just, you know, I, I'm, I'm wondering, I know you wrote this before the pandemic, so I, I want to offer you the opportunity to apply this book to this period of time we've gone through and, and moving forward now that we're, we're sort of starting to open up again. And I think, you know, people are trying to figure out what do we carry forward? What are the good things we learned? What are the things we don't want to take with us? Um, and I'm just wondering how you see that, this opening up again through the lens of your book. You know, I will be honest and say that I don't think of it as a pandemic book or pandemic mm -hmm. specific book. Um, and so I, other people have asked me that and I sort of, I, I've tried to think of a better answer than, <laughs> I don't, I, I, what I think is that what the pandemic did offer us was a chance to loosen our attachment to a particular kind of schedule. Um, mm -hmm one that made us see possibility in our daily lives that we didn't before, um, possibility that stands outside our, um, our sense of what is given. I've used that word over culture before. We had this whole idea of what a nine to five workday would look like and it did not include pajamas and now it does. 
and it did not include time out back in your backyard playing with your dog and now it does and so i think there's that invitation to sort of loosen our sense of how we can be in the world um but i will say this that i sincerely hope that it it doesn't lead to an idea that a world where this is how we do books from now on although i think there's beautiful things about this i think that i hope it um and it's so grateful for this platform and, and nights like this, but I miss hugging people and signing books. And I hope we don't just kind of go, oh, well, this was easier and no one has to leave their homes anymore. I hope that we can, I hope that while loosening certain constrictions, it invites us to remember how profound and important our connection is to one another. Yeah, and I also think, I mean, I'm out here in a much smaller town and I, we could see and hear the difference those those first couple months when when traffic just stopped and air travel stopped and the, the things you could hear, the things you could see, the change you could see in the water. I mean, I could see it from our house and it's a half a mile away. You know, I mean, it just, that to me, you know, completely convinced me of the interconnectivity. I mean, I, I love all the parts about the trees and the fungus and all of that that's harder to see, this you could see, you know, and was like, yep, we have that effect. And, and I hope that through books like yours, which will continue to remind us, because I think it's going to be really easy to fall back into old ways of being. And even though your book is not a pandemic book, I think it's a good post-pandemic reminder that we need to remember these things, that we can't just go back to the way we were before, because the planet can't handle it. We simply can't. Um, so um, I wanna make sure we're leaving time for questions. So people feel free to add things into the chat at this point and we will pick up your questions. Um, I have a couple more for you while we're waiting. Um, and I, so can you talk just a little bit about night walking? We have a tradition in our family of going for what we call dark walks. And we, we take the teenagers out and scare the bejesus out of them and make them walk around in the woods <laughs> with us. Um, we since found out that they're cougars and so maybe we don't do it quite so much. But, um, but the things you learn about that, and I love that section of the book where you talk about being young and learning how to night walk. And if you can talk about that a little bit, that would be great. Yeah, and one of the things I try to do in this book is break down dualities and one of the big dualities we have in our culture is that dark is bad and light is good. And people that are doing good in the world are light bearers. And I mean, we see this in our hymns and our, our metaphors all the time that, you know, um, bring the light oh, in our political punditry that we're living in a dark time. And I set myself a, a challenge, Erica, when I wrote this book, um, I thought I'm going to write it without using that metaphor, without using dark as a metaphor for bad or the difficult. And it was super hard. I had to pick up my pencil and cross out, you know, I plopped that word in just over and over again in that context. And it actually really surprised me because life depends on darkness, right? 90% of life on earth takes place in absolute darkness, places beneath the soil and so deep in the waters of the seas that light literally cannot penetrate. And yet it's that life that our life depends on, you know, the decomposition, the upwelling um, of the oceans is the, the life that gives life to our topside world, our, our world in the, in the part light half daylight. So uh, not to get too philosophical about that. That's but, fascinating. <laughs> When I was young, I thought I, I realized that I didn't have that good of night vision. And uh, I saw that others were just more comfortable walking around in the dark than I was. And so I was living in Minnesota at this little uh, environmental learning center where I was working. And there was this three mile trail around the lake. And I thought, I'm going to start walking around that every night in the dark. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have cell phones. I didn't bring a flashlight. I did tell friends where I was going. And it was, a, it was Minnesota. It was flat. Um, but I just wore moccasins so I could sort of feel the earth and went out into the night every night. And I tell a story of someone I met along the path and I'll see if I can show that picture because it's one of my favorites. Um, but it taught me for myself that the question wasn't, how do I get better at seeing in the dark? But how do I just not worry about whether or not I can see in the dark? How do I just be in the darkness and let that be fruitful? So I did have an encounter. You have to read the book to see how that goes. But I love uh, Helen's kind of feathery moose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I love that idea of uh, Joan Halifax, the Buddhist teacher, American Buddhist teacher, um, used, she titled a book, The Fruitful Darkness. And I love that phrase, how we can be um, unsettled and yet still at home in these places where in the dark are, are um, the, the ways that we find our way the um that mark our way are, are invisible to us and so we have to find other way markers and we do we do yeah again it's the same thing of thinking um just because we can't see you know there are plenty of animals that can see in the dark but just because we can't see then it's bad right and it's like no it's just that your eyes are different <laughs> you know um, yes. so i'm following right along in here um keith uh creighton i hope i'm saying that right has a question what's your view about hiking are we walking into the living room of bears and wild cats should we coexist in the deep forests and hills or just stay away? Um, I, as a living strategy, I believe in urban density <laughs> in general. Um, although as Erica knows, I long to live in a rural, more rural place. I'm gonna be joining her in Port Townsend if I can convince my husband. <laughs> but uh, as far as hiking goes, I think that um, challenging ourselves to be at home in the wilderness is, uh, is, a really good invitation for our minds, a really good invitation for our brains, our bodies um, to use physical and mental exertion in combination really heightens all of our senses and awareness and awareness of what other than human beings are facing in the world. And so I think we have to use common sense about the presence of potential. Um, but the, yes, there are cougars in the woods they don't want to see us or, or eat us. There are, there was a tragedy um, in our state a few years back, um, but so, so rare and such a, such a terribly uncommon tragic happening. Um, the last cougar death in um, Washington state was a hundred years prior. So that's how rare it is um, compared to getting in our cars. And we know the common, we need to know the common sense precautions to take if we meet a cougar or a um, bear brown or black, what to do when you get a tick, if you live in tick country, what plants to avoid. So using common sense when we go deeper into the wilderness is just a matter of all just common sense. Um, but I do think that, I do believe in, in pressing our edges when we are able to do it. Yeah. I still remember we were gonna hike the West Coast Trail on Vancouver Island and you have to talk to a naturalist before you go out because it's a pretty, um, we'll just call it rustic, <laughs> it's remote. Um, and I remember her saying there is a 10% chance that you will see a cougar or a bear and there is a 90% chance that that cougar or bear will see you. Um, and I thought that that was a, a great way to understand that you're out there and that you're probably being seen far more than you're seeing anything. And then again, you need to know how to act. You need to know how to yeah. be. Um, okay, another question from Andrea Baker. Since early childhood, I've experienced and benefited from a very strong connection to trees. I consider them beings. I consider them beings of tremendous importance. For the past twenty years, I've lived in a semi-rural, forested area in Northern California with a lot of coastal redwoods. Originally from the South, where there were lots of big weather events like tornadoes, nothing has gotten to me like the drought this area has been under. I've witnessed the changes ongoing and worsening. My feelings about this go far beyond climate change anxiety. I'm watching a dear close friend, this whole fragile ecosystem, being treated, being threatened, and dying. I'm not sure how to ask my question. How do we transform the conversation to recognize how nature is us? Do you, do you yourself sense that if we don't embrace that fundamental interconnectedness, we are participating in the demise of our own species? Oh, Andrea, that's a beautiful question. And I, I, your language around it is, is very um, touching, you know, moving. And yeah, that, that is exactly what I'm saying. I don't think I can say it even any better than you framed it in that question. but. I agree with you. I feel that the trees are living presences that we can come into contact with in term, just by the way that we, just by a shift in awareness. Um, one of the invitations that I give in my book for coming into that kind of relationship of kinship and kinship with trees is to read out loud to them. To, and I think poetry is a good medium. So it doesn't mean that we're anthropomorphizing the tree. We don't necessarily expect the tree to understand our human language, but we, it brings us into a, um, 
that idea of, you know, what would, what would I choose for this tree in this moment? And it brings us into this kind of language that might be more appropriate than our everyday language for being with trees. It's just one thing I kind of throw out there for, for fun, but also, also for beauty. And I think when we, when we read to trees, it seems, I will honestly tell you that it sounds weirder than it actually feels once you get going. <laughs> Once you get started, it starts to feel very normal and you can come into after maybe a little practice, you come to this feeling that the tree is responding. Maybe you hear a little hush of wind. Am I saying that it's related exactly to the fact that you're reading poetry? No, but I'm saying that you're engaging in this, this invitation into um, interconnection of the knowledge that you um, as Vietnamese um, Zen master and poet Thich Nhat Hanh says interbeing. He talks about our interbeing with the rest of life. And so, you know, Andrea, I think he's onto something very important. And we all need that interconnection that you're speaking of going forward and to this very, very, um, this, you know, I'm just looking outside and seeing the temperatures rise here in the Pacific Northwest. Erica and I were talking about this a little bit before this show. And all of us are remembering the wildfires of last year and last season and just hoping in our hearts that nothing like that happens again, but knowing that unless we really act from that place of radical communion, linked to good science and taking action on that, that um, um, change is not possible without that. And the, the starting point, I think, is that sense of interconnection on a personal level. So well, I think one of the things your book does is it, it you know, it's easy to say, okay, but you're just reading poetry to a tree. I mean, that's not going to change it. And yet, I think what, the, what your book says so powerfully is that, you know, when you operate from a position of fear or a position of scarcity, or, you know, these trees are going to die, so we should save them because they are a resource. That's a very different thing than operating from a position of love, of communion, of empathy. And I think that when you have that feeling, your commitment to change, your commitment to politics is going to be different and much deeper. And I think that's one of the things I, I really got from your book was that feeling that um, it's, a, it's a substantive change inside yourself with how you are relating to this thing. Um, you know, it's not a product, it's not a resource, it's, it's something that you have a relationship with. And, uh, you know, maybe it's because, you know, we're both mothers, but I will fight to the death for the things I have a relationship with. You know, that's, that's not just a theoretical concept, um, but that kind of reaction that you get. Um, I think that I think that's in many times what you're going for in your book, and I think it's important. Um, and I think we discount that too much. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I do think that's we're all looking for the things to to motivate us in that right. way. Um, so there's a, another question here um, for someone being for someone new to being in nature. Is there a book or website you recommend on how to be kind to nature while taking in its beauty? I think this means other than your book. So if you've got other recommendations, because I would recommend your book for that. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I do recommend my book. Actually, that's what I wrote it for. I wrote it for people that were, were either, you know, seasoned at being in the natural world and looking for something deeper or people that are just kind of wanting that beckoning invitation to kind of say, here, give, give, give you some encouragement, give you that footing, um, finding your footing in that conversation and, and um, taking, wandering into that path. Um, let me see what, uh, what other books. Um, Gosh, so I, my, my brain is just being flooded with too many, actually. Um, choose one. I will choose the book, The Edge of the Sea by Rachel Carson. Mm -hmm. She wrote it before, um, she wrote it before Silent Spring and very few people know of this book anymore. And what I love about it is that it's just sort of, she as a scientist and naturalist takes your hand and goes deeply into all the beings of the East Coast seashore. And I just find it so calming because it looks at every individual organism and she describes it with such calm and such precision and such empathy that it just makes you feel that, all right, we can come to understand uh, rather more than just, you know, looking at the sea and thinking, oh, it's just pretty. We can come to understand um, 
knowledge that we think is, we can come to know the names of the birds and the plants and the organisms, things that we think we are left to other people or people that are super nerdy or into birds or natural history. All of us can kind of come into that um, way of being where we kind of go, oh, I can really have some knowledge that matters about this. And she just makes it a calming, beautiful thing to do. And I think that what you said, Erica, um, about that kind of thing, not seeming small in comparison to what we think of as traditional act activism, you know, getting out with the megaphone and marching on the legislators and writing letters, which is all very, very important. But I think, as you say, that our individual connections is a form of activism in that it is what drives our passion and our activism. And so all of these little steps where we build love and communion and empathy really are not, not we cannot separate them from more hardcore political activism. They, they are absolutely intertwined. Okay. We have just like two minutes left. So I wanna do like a little speed thing with you. Um, because I think, you know, so much of what you're writing about is really paying attention and being a part of the environment with your body, you know, like mind and body. So what I want to know is, I'm just going to go through your senses. So watch out. I just want to know, like, when you're out in nature, what's your favorite smell? My favorite smell? Um, mm -hmm. Cedar wood. I, I actually like to stick my nose right into the bark of a cedar tree and inhale deeply. Okay. How is that different from like a pine tree or a sequoia or a... Well, you have to find that out by sniffing yourself. But uh, I mean, smells like you. if this was a wine, how would we describe it? <laughs> For me, it's very, um, it's, it, it, it mirrors its color. It's sort of a deep red, sharp color that is more fragrant. Uh, no, it's differently fragrant. You, I think that when you, you see it, you're, you're walking on decomposed cedar trees when you hike in the Pacific Northwest. So the soil is often red beneath your feet. And I think there's something that invites that connection of earthiness. So I smell um, the cedar and I, I feel the earth beneath my feet. Oh, that's cool. Anyway. <laughs> I love how you just got to riff off that. Okay. Um, what's your favorite site? Um, you know, I, I love looking at the Salish Sea when the, we, we live over, I, I just walk 50 yards up a hill and I can see the Salish Sea and I love it when the sun is going down and the water's still, um, it's just a magical moment of the day and it makes me feel, um, cause we live as my friend Linda Mapes just, uh, just brought out the new book Orca, Shared Home, Shared Waters about the Southern resident Orca here. Um, I think about the days that they appear in those waters and we see them and I see them whether or not they're there or not. When I look at it, that still water it makes me feel that connection. That's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I love that site. Yeah, yeah. All right, how about sound? Favorite sound out in nature? Swainson's Fresh. Um, okay, you got to go with uh, this needs explanation. Okay, the Swainson's Fresh is a migrant from um, Central America and Mexico. It's a little bird that's brown, kind of fawn colored, spotted, and we will see them walking on the forest floor, which is they're kind of close to the earth bird. And uh, the Swainson's Fresh has this most magical sound, and I will not try to imitate it, but I'm going to only sort of try to imitate it. It's it's like a it's like an upward funnel waterfall it goes higher up and if you've heard one only beautiful thrushy fluty layers of sound and it's so magical that i had a friend last summer or maybe the summer before because of the pandemic um, who came back from camping and he just said i was camping and i was in the tent i heard this amazing bird and i wanted to ask you and i said it's a swainson's thrush and he said you don't know i didn't say anything i said did it sound like this and he said how did you know that <laughs> he said because most people don't mention a bird song or remember it, but that one is so touching. And it's just, it's also ethereal and kind of ventriloquial. So in the misty morning of the Pacific Northwest forest, it sounds like it could be coming from anywhere or all around us at once. It's a beautiful song. Cool. cool. Okay. I don't, uh, Jamie, let me know if we should be heading out at this point, maybe. That was fantastic. Thank you both. I really enjoyed the conversation. I did just want to follow up the anonymous attendee 
said, um, ha, yes, of course, other than Le uh, Leanda's book, I have that on my list. I was curious to know what she reads. Thank you for answering my question as it was on the spot. Um, along with that, I've gotten tons of feedback thanking us and thanking both of you for being with us tonight. And as always, everyone on here tonight will receive an email tomorrow. It'll have all the details, the discount code for tonight's title, uh, links for other titles by both authors, a link to the recording. I'll also include the recommended read by Leanda. Other than that, I really appreciate everyone joining us. A huge thank you to Erica, a huge thank you to Leanda and what you had to say about independent bookstores really hit close to home. So thank you for that. And on that, Landa, do you want to go ahead and take us out for the evening? Sure. Thank you, Erica, for those incredible, thoughtful questions. Jamie, for your flawless management. And especially tonight, thank you, Copperfields Books, for having me and being just such a proud, just a proud example of an independent bookstore, which in this time more than ever, I think we've all come to recognize in what sense, alongside libraries, independent bookstores are the soul of a wild community of wildness in our community. They are an invitation to ideas and community and there is no other way to have that. And so support Copperfields tonight, get your discount code and carry on supporting our beautiful uh, independent booksellers. Thank you Copperfields, really. Thank you, have a great evening.